Good morning. Um, so welcome to Life Community Baptist Church this morning. Welcome to everyone who's joined us on Zoom and to anyone listening on uh, YouTube, although I think that the YouTube streaming has just failed and I am not going to do anything about that now. So um, we'll sort that out later um, and get it posted. Um, my name's Andy. I'm leading the service this morning. Our minister Pete is on holiday. Um, later this morning we're going to hear from Kevin who's continuing our theme of conversations on the journey, um, particularly looking at the topic of suffering. Um, this is my first time leading a uh, online service so feel free to offer a quick prayer about the whole thing. <laughs> um, I was reminded that the, the last time I was supposed to be involved in leading just a normal church service I arranged to be in New Orleans. Um, that weekend, which meant that we'd work, which meant no, I didn't, I got out of that one. Unfortunately, I can't do that this week. So, All right, so just as we come to worship this morning, I um, just want to remind everyone that you are made in the image of God and He loves you. That's something that I've been sort of reminded of again and again recently. and really feel that I want to remind people of every time we come to worship. Um, we have some songs prepared by our worship team. Feel free to sing along or meditate on the words as they're played. Just, um, you know, engage with them as you are. So just as we start, we've got Sarah and Matt leading us and reminding us that God is our good, good father.
Good. Yeah. It's good to be reminded that God is our good, good father and that we're loved by him. Um, I was reminded again this week that when we come to worship, our worship services are not just to make us um, feel good, but they're a moment for us to pause and to breathe before we push into the next week of work and work and things that we do on our front lines to communicate the love of God to other people as well. And we're going to look at a verse this morning that's encouraging us to do that as well. This is something that Kevin's going to pick up in his thing. So I'm going to read this. I'm going to read it in a couple of different versions during the service this morning. So, so all praise to the God and Father of our Master, Jesus the Messiah, Father of all mercy, God of all healing counsel. He comes alongside us when we go through hard times, and before you know it, he brings us alongside someone else who is going through hard times so that we can be there for that person, just as God was there for us. We have plenty of hard times that comes from following the Messiah, but no more so than the good times of his healing comfort. We get a full measure of that too. This verse is reminding us that God will use the hard times that we go through um, that we experience in our lives to help others as well.
yeah, we are his hands and feet and we do want to be reminded of those who are suffering and just now gonna let uh, Hillary uh, lead us in prayer and uh, maybe uh, as, we, as she does just maintain that sort of sense of prayerfulness that we've got at the moment. Let, let us pray. Father, we thank you for the gift of this day. We thank you that you are the giver of life. You sent your son to die for us and to rise again, that we might have life in all its fullness. And yesterday, Lord, we remembered victory over Japan 75 years ago. And we're thankful to all of those who gave their lives for our freedom. And we remember those few who remain. And we thank you for their willingness to suffer that we might have that freedom. And we pray that they will continue to tell their stories so that we may never forget the horrors of war and that we will do all that we can to prevent such atrocities happening again and that we will never take our freedom for granted. But today, Lord, we face another kind of war on an unseen enemy, the coronavirus, which has impacted the world in ways we never imagined. And as I pray for this section, if you can respond after I say, Lord, hear us, to yourselves quietly, just respond, Lord, graciously hear us. So Father, for all who are affected by the coronavirus through illness or isolation or anxiety, we pray that they may find relief and recovery. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. For those who are guiding our nation at this time and shaping national policies, we pray that they may make wise decisions and listen to your leading and your guiding. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. For the doctors and nurses who continue to care for the sick and dying, for the medical researchers, that through their skills and insights, many will be restored to health. And we pray that a vaccine will soon be available to help overcome this deadly virus. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. For the vulnerable and the fearful, for the gravely ill and the dying, for all those who have been bereaved through this virus, may they know your comfort and your peace. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. Father, we thank you that you are our refuge and our stronghold. And we pray for the health and well-being of our nation, that those who are fearful and anxious may be at peace and free from worry, that it may be your peace, which passes all understanding, will be theirs. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. For the isolated and housebound, may we be alert to their needs and care for them in their vulnerability. May they know they are not alone, but are loved by you, by our words and our deeds. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. For our homes and our families, our children and young people, and all in any kind of need or distress. Father, we do pray especially for the children and young people who have been confined and are struggling 
having missed out on their studies and their social interaction with their friends. We pray that you will draw near to them. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. We pray for a blessing on our local community, that our neighbourhoods may be places of trust and friendship, where all are known and cared for. Help us to play our part wherever we live or work. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. So we commend ourselves and all for whom we pray to your mercy and your protection, O Lord. We pray we will accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. And then, Father, we pray for those we know who are going through difficult times in the fellowship. We pray for John, and we pray for strength to face the challenges that lie ahead for him. We protect him and Anne, and that you'll keep them strong and well. And we pray for your healing touch for him. We pray for Rachel too, still undergoing tests and waiting for results of tests. And pray for your healing and your blessing, and that you will draw near to her as well. And just take a moment to think of those you know personally who are in need of God's healing touch or his peace or the unfolding of his love at this time. And Father, we want to pray particularly for those who will be returning to work and especially for those who are preparing to return to school next month. We pray for the children and for the teachers and we pray for your protection upon them. And we pray that there will be a time of blessing, that they will enjoy the opportunity of going back, that they'll not be fearful or afraid, but they will know your presence and that they will enjoy learning and not take that for granted, that friendships will be restored. And we pray that burdens will be eased for the families that have had to endure such a, a close proximity in confined spaces. So we pray that it will be time of, of release and a try, time of blessing. So we pray for your protection and your blessing upon each one of us at this time and help us to draw near to you and that we might be channels of your blessing and your peace and your love to those who desperately need the gospel of Jesus Christ in these unprecedented days. And we ask these things in the name of our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Hilary. I, um, so this is our verse for the morning and um, I'm going to read it now in the NIV, more traditional um, version that you might be more familiar with. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. For just as we share abundantly in the sufferings of Christ, so also our comfort abounds through Christ. This next song Julie put together for us this week, and it was on one of my favourite worship albums of the last 10 years. Um, Matt Redmond's song, Blessed Be Your Name. So let's uh, listen to this. <laughs> Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful, where the streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when I found in the desert place, though I walk through the wilderness. 
I'm going to pray for um, Kevin now as he's going to talk to us and uh, I just want to um, pray for him before he does that. So Father, I just pray that you would help Kevin to communicate the, the word that you've put on his heart, the things that you've given him that he wants to share with us. I pray that you would uh, give him clarity and help him to just be able to communicate those things and we would hear them and that each person here today will get something from what Kevin is going to share with us. So. Okay, good morning everyone. Yeah, I've been asked to speak on the subject of suffering. For a little while now we've been looking at various questions of life and suffering is certainly one particularly important subject. It's also one that affects us at the deepest level. So I don't want to address this with trite comments. Cheap plastic answers just won't help. But I would like this morning to give some pointers that may offer some genuine help and may bring some comfort and hope to hurting souls. So let's start by asking, what is the question? At heart, it's this. If God is a good God and he loves us so much, then why does he allow us to suffer? Why is there so much apparently pointless injury, disease, and death, particularly of those who seem to be so innocent? 
Why doesn't God step in and prevent it? In fact, this is the reason that many people give as to why they don't entrust their lives to God. Why should I trust someone, they say, who allows such awful things to happen to me or to somebody else? Even famous scientists have come up against this one. Charles Darwin, for example, lost his faith in Providence after the death of his 10-year-old daughter. And David Attenborough puts it this way, Are you telling me that the God you believe in, who you also say is an all-merciful God, who cares for each one of us individually, are you saying that God created a parasitic worm that can live in no other way than in an innocent child's eyeball, because that doesn't seem to me to coincide with a God who's full of mercy? But let's pause for a moment and examine David Attenborough's reply. Do you see that his reluctance to trust God is not based on scientific reasons at all, but on theological ones? He is actually making a judgment call on what it means to be merciful and how he believes God should behave. Yet he is doing so as an atheistic scientist. And incidentally, he's wrong about the worm. He has confused two different creatures. So let's first of all deal with this matter of atheism. Many people don't realize that atheism is inherently self-refuting. It destroys itself. It can be demonstrated in just four sentences, and they are these. If there is no God, then there's no objective morality. If no objective morality, then no basis for judgment. If no basis for judgment, then nothing can be true. If nothing can be true, then atheism is not true. Hence, I don't propose to discuss atheism any further this morning, as it's so clearly wrong. Let's focus instead on the subjects that we really do need to address if we're to come to any understanding of this issue of suffering. At heart, they are these. Firstly, we need an understanding of who God is and what he is like. We need an understanding of who we are and what we're like. And we need an understanding of the nature of God's purposes. Let's start by looking at God the Bible tells us that God created all things, all of the created universe of matter, energy, space, and time. Everything was formed by his hands. Consequently, God must be outside of matter, energy, space, and time. He must be far greater than it all. He must transcend it. This immediately gives us a difficulty as we can't comprehend such a being. He is beyond our understanding. And in fact, Scripture itself tells us this very thing. Isaiah 55, verses 8 to 9 says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Of all the books in the Bible, the book of Job describes severe suffering in great detail. It's interesting that this is thought to be one of the oldest books in the Bible, suggesting not only that suffering is an ancient problem for mankind, but it's one that God chose to address even from earliest times. So what does the book of Job tell us? Firstly, that suffering can often seem inexplicable. And secondly, that people we know may try to give us reasons for the suffering that are completely wrong. And in the process of doing so, they may wound us still further through their false condemnation and lack of true insight, help and comfort. In the end, God himself turns up to talk it through with Job. But what does God say? Firstly, he points out that Job's perspective and understanding are extremely limited compared to God's own wisdom. For example, God challenges Job by saying, 
Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me, if you have understanding, who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Well, of course, Job didn't know. He didn't have a clue. Job needed a humility lesson. That is, he needed to understand that his true position before God was to bow before the majesty of the wisdom of God. He wasn't in a position to be a critic. Job was incapable of comprehending all that was going on. But secondly, and this is the really profound thing, even after Job repents of his attitude, God still doesn't go on to give Job a full picture. Why not? For the same reason that we've already mentioned, God knows that we cannot grasp things as God does. So he doesn't ask us to do so. Instead, he gives us a choice. We can either continue to strive to understand what is going on and fail continually to do so, or we can choose the much wiser option to just put our trust in God. But at this point, we have to ask the question that so many people fail to get through on. We have to ask, is God indeed trustworthy? Can we trust him? Can we trust him with our lives even when our circumstances may include the most dreadful and apparently unjust suffering. The devil would suggest that we can't trust God. He has been blackening God's character throughout history. But is he right? Is God, after all, just a cruel and capricious tyrant who doesn't really care about us, but merely tosses us around as he wishes? Is there any evidence that would convince us that God is inherently good? Fortunately, yes, there is. There is evidence that the devil cannot refute, try as he might. And it is truly ironic evidence. You see, we can know that God cares about our suffering because he himself has also suffered. He can empathize with all our pain because he has been there too. He sent his son Jesus to willingly suffer and die a cruel death on the cross, even though he was completely innocent, so that we might have a hope and a future. The devil has no answer to this. So why then does God allow us to suffer? Although we cannot fully comprehend his ways, is there anything we can learn to give us hope and comfort? In the first place, we need to understand that we are truly unique beings. In all of the creation, heavens and earth, it is only humans that have been created in the image of God. No angels have been created in this way. No birds or animals. Only humankind has been given this high privilege. But this is where we often have problems because we can fail to appreciate the implications. If we have been created to be image bearers, then when someone sees us, they should see a reflection of God himself. That is what it means to be an image. In profound ways, we are intended to reflect the glory of God himself. And that is where we have all failed. For all of us have fallen into sin and we live in a fallen world. Of ourselves, we don't naturally reflect God's character. Instead, we have a fallen, carnal, self-centered nature. This is a gross insult to God. Our fallen nature is actually continually telling lies about what God is like. No wonder that God says in Romans 6 verse 23 that the wages of sin is death. This is an utter tragedy because not only were we originally intended to be true image bearers of God himself, but we were also intended to be his children. He loved us and he loves us still. So it was heartbreaking for him to see us not only rebel against his good plan for us, but also become subject to death and eternal separation from himself. One of the most tragic sentences in the whole of the Bible is 2 Thessalonians 1 verse 9, which reads, They will be punished with eternal destruction, forever separated from the Lord and from his glorious power. 
So we see that the stubborn pursuit of our own carnal will actually becomes our own punishment. This also indicates so clearly how horrible the devil is. His intention was to set himself up in opposition to God, constituting himself as God's enemy. So what was his plan to wreak the greatest possible damage and pain against God? He struck against God's own dear children, enticing them to change their nature to something miserable and to be separated forever from the face of God their Father. That's you and me, folks. That is what the devil intended our fate to be. But fortunately, God knew this would happen, and he already had a plan. This is why in Revelation 13, verse 8, it says, All inhabitants of the earth will worship the beast, all whose names have not been written in the Lamb's book of life, the Lamb who was slain from the creation of the world. Notice that slain from the creation of the world. In other words, foreordained by God, who knows everything and is never, ever caught by surprise. Now this amazing sacrifice by Jesus on our behalf puts us right with God. It means that we're now back on track with God's purpose for us. Romans 12 verse 2 puts it this way, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. So what is this purpose that we can approve? It's this. God has made us not only to be his children, but also his heirs. Hence, during our time remaining here on earth, he wants us to become mature sons and daughters. He wants us to become like Jesus. As 2 Corinthians 3 verse 18 says, And we all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. It's important to point out that God is committed to this. He isn't going to change his mind. This is his plan and purpose for us because he loves us so much. So we can say, great, God is going to use all his grace and might and power to help me become like Jesus. That's fantastic. Well, it is indeed wonderful to rejoice in. We are in God's hands and his purposes for us are good. But watch out. Are we ready for this? God is so committed to us that he may deem it necessary to use tools for the job that we don't like and wouldn't naturally accept. Let me give an analogy. Suppose that as a child you ate too many sticky sweets and you developed some tooth decay and infection. The dentist might tell you that the tooth has got to be drilled and filled, otherwise things will get worse, not better. Now, what child likes going to the dentist with the prospect of the pain and discomfort of having a tooth filled? Do you think that most children would willingly embrace that? Not jolly likely. Most children would run and hide. It needs the wisdom of a parent to make the child go through a hard time because it's necessary and the end purpose is good. In the same way, God is our parent. Sometimes he may need to put us through very difficult circumstances in order to deal with some besetting sin or character defect in our personalities that he knows very well we would not deal with but would actually run from if it was left to us. So this is God's strange work. He may actually discipline us through suffering in order to help perfect our character. At this point, you're all permitted to be horrified by this realization. God's love is so profound that it is actually a ruthless love. He won't allow you to get away with something that is ultimately bad for you. Sooner or later, he will refine your and my character. 
suffering is one of his tools. For example, Hebrews chapter 12, verses 6 to 7 says, The Lord disciplines the one he loves, and he chastens everyone he accepts as his son. Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as his children. For what children are not disciplined by their father? Even Jesus went through this experience. Not that there was anything wrong with his character, but in ways we find it hard to understand, he too learned obedience through suffering. Hebrews chapter 5 verses 8 to 9 says, Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered, and being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him. So, are we saying that God deliberately makes us suffer? No, not at all. He is a good God. He doesn't create suffering for us. He's not punishing us. I'd like to say that again, as many people make this mistake, he is not punishing us. But he does use suffering. We live in a fallen world where suffering is inevitable. But God graciously uses it to actually help us. He intervenes to cause it to be a tool to help us become more like Jesus. This is both amazing and scary. And there's another factor as well. Sometimes this carnal, sinful nature of ours can be so strongly set in its ways that it's impossible for the Holy Spirit to be released through us as God would wish like a hard, sealed alabaster jar, the perfume inside cannot come out. In such circumstances, there is only one thing for it. The jar has to be broken. Suffering can do that in us. We lose our self-strength in such adversity. We become broken, that is, we become open vessels, vessels that God can use. But at this point, we need to balance these comments by pointing out that God doesn't allow us to suffer all the time. As Andy has said, he also brings love, grace, and comfort into our lives. He knows our frame, he knows we are weak, and he knows what we need. It's great, therefore, to know that God declares himself to be not only a God of love, but also a God of comfort. As it says in 2 Corinthians 1, verses 3 to 5, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles, so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. For just as we share abundantly in the sufferings of Christ, so also our comfort abounds through Christ. The Apostle James starts his letter on this very subject of suffering. He boldly says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Someone on Facebook recently put it this way, I love seeing my friends do well in life, especially the ones that I know who have been through the dark days and have come out shining. As Matthew 13 verse 43 says, the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. That is our glorious future. So let's hold on to that blessed hope when we pass through the valley of suffering. Amen. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Thank you, Kevin. Thanks. So for those of you who are on Zoom with us now, we're going to take the opportunity to um, do what we can do as, as a church, which is not only just listen to um, the message that someone brings, but also to discuss it and share our own experience, you know, um, often the, the teaching that we have is reinforced by the experience and sharing of testimony. And if there's anything that's um, 
touched you during the service. We're going to go into some smaller groups now. Um, and if you want, you could choose to discuss about how we should respond when either we or someone else we know goes through suffering. You might have your own testimony or encouragement that you want to share with others. So I'm going to put you into breakout rooms. So for those of you who are watching on YouTube, um, we're going to listen to uh, one last final song that hopefully is a, a response to the, the words that Kevin shared with us this morning. Um, his uh, Lord, I need you. Lord, I come, I confess, bowing here, I find my rest. Without you, I fall apart. You're the one that guides my heart. Lord, I So that's the end of our service on uh, YouTube this morning. I hope that you um, have found it useful. I pray that you would um, take some of those thoughts into your next week. Um, if you want any more information about the church, you can find us on www.life-baptist.org.uk and we will 
have another service next week if you need anything or want any more information apart from the website there's contact details on the website so thank you very much and have a good week <laughs>